Hi there, thanks for joining me for another episode of Draw, Make, and Code. And in this episode, we're going to be making melting lines. As a, a title for this, it definitely describes what's happening here, but the procedures could be more accurately described by following boxes. That's an old generative art that goes back to the 1960s, the late 1960s, that was created by this guy here, George Neese whose work is still inspiring people today. That's why I'm doing this work here. Instead of boxes, rows of boxes, we're going to use where a box is as a vertex, and we're going to draw a line between those vertices, and then the boxes are falling at different rates, and it's going to make that line look like it's melting. So based on this procedure from 1968, we're going to make something a little bit different and a little bit more contemporary using P5JS. So to get started on this code, we're going to open a new sketch in P5JS. You can use that or P5 Live. It works in either one. Once you've opened the sketch, you're going to set the canvas to the available window width and window height. And then we're going to just three easy variables here. One to hold the rate of descent for the, the boxes, if you will, the number of those boxes, and then a variable to hold it as an object so that we can cycle through a bunch of these boxes in like a an array. So inside setup we're going to set to fall a new instance of our function that's going to do the melting of our lines. And that's pretty much all you do there. Set your background to 0 and 255 and set up in case you want to persist the output and draw, which we're going to do. And uh, just so we can see things happening at start, we're going to use 255. Then inside draw, we're going to isolate everything inside of push and pop in case you want to do some stuff. It's all kind of contained if you want to rotate the canvas, whatever. And then inside that, we're going to call the update method of the function from the fall object. And then we're going to check and see if the last object is down the screen so far, and if it is, then we're going to reset everything back to the beginning and maybe degrade the background a little bit. So that's happening in draw. That's pretty much all of that. So the next thing we want to do is start our function that does all of the melty line stuff. And we're going to start with the constructor part of that. In the global space of this function, we're going to have a method that's called this.update. That's the meat and potatoes, and we're going to get to that later. Before we can even jump to that, we have to create some arrays and, and get those initialized. So we need an X and Y position. That's going to keep track of each of the vertices, or in the uh, George Knees example, the boxes. And then we're going to move those down the screen, and they're kind of accelerating. So we need that uh, value held in an array. And then we need the velocity for each one that will take the acceleration. And then I have a variable here called this.r. It's not in use, but that can hold a rotational value if you want to put an object in there. Then we need something uh, to keep track of the elements in the array. And then we're going to use some color values so we can get some variety in the output. And this is going to come back to haunt me at the end of the video, and you'll see that I'm starting with zero for all of my colors. So I'm going to forget that, and it's going to cause me a little bit of extra time. So. Uh, when we get to that point, I'll, I'll show you what's going on. So before we go into update, we have to set values to all of those initial arrays. So right now they're blank, and we're going to create our loop for our rows and columns. That's our Y and our X. So we're going inside the Y loop, we're doing our X loop, right? So inside that X loop, that's where we're setting all of our values. And that's going to arrange things so that they're... Um, the row at the top is differentiated from the rows at underneath them and that's important and we're just going to set those values to zero because uh, the locations are going to come from the loops and then we're going to add to that location the change so it's kind of like a fixed place and then we're displaying how far away from that fixed place are we and that's giving us this uh, melty output so to make things easier, we're going to set to a local variable this noise value that's going to adjust the acceleration so that each vertices has a unique acceleration. 
And if we do that to noise, it'll be kind of relational. And you'll get a neat effect that way. We'll set our velocity to zero, and then that rotational value, you can set it to zero there as well. So let's get into the main part of the program. So we're going to be moving through some arrays inside a couple loops. So we need to keep track of the element, which one we're on. So let's set the index value to negative one, and then before we access an array inside those loops, we'll just advance to the next index value or the next element in the arrays. And then each time in draw, when we go to this dot update, we want to start with fresh noise values. We don't want to produce the same melty lines each time. So let's set uh, the global or the local variable x off to a random value. Then we're going to create our column loop R Y, and then we're going to do begin shape and end shape. And inside the begin shape and end shape, we're going to do our X loop, and that's where everything is going to get put together, so that the top row is distinct from the next row under it, is distinct from the next row under it, and so on and so forth. Inside the X loop, this is where we advance to the next element in the array. And I started to put in this statement here, which I should have just left in. But I took it out because it's a part of the original code, which worked in boxes. And that's what the this.r is for, because I was rotating boxes originally. And then I thought, oh, let's draw lines. Well, I didn't take out everything. So when I started doing this video, I noticed that this was one of the relics from that previous version. So I took it out. Well, it actually was working with what I had there. And I didn't realize it, but I'll explain that here a little bit later. Uh, for now, just skip that part and we're going to advance our velocity by adding to it the acceleration. Then we're going to add the um, velocity to the position that we're at, this POSY value. And then we're going to look at where our actual value is and then we're going to add it to that. And that's going to give us our display value. So it's kind of like a range away from home if you will. So we want to check and see, let's look at the, the next row down. Are we going to overtake that, that vertex? And if we are, let's stop. Let's uh, just stop right there and we'll accelerate it or we'll move at the same rate as that one. And this is going to create kind of a neat effect. And to be perfectly honest, I'm not 100% sure that my math is lined up. So it may not be looking at the exact one in front of it. It's hard for me to tell. It could be, uh, I don't know, sometimes when it's like this output, it, it, it really looks different. It's hard to tell if it's working. So that's why if you look at it on like a full intensity background so that there's no blur or distortion, it lets you see if it's working right. So the next thing I want to do is use this this uh, Y mod to get that position down the screen that needs to be that distance away. And that's where I'm adding the location Y and I'm adding it to that movement location. And then because of the way things are displayed on the screen, I have to adjust for that as well. So that's why that is kind of complicated. And then once that's done, you just put in your curve vertex or vertex and give it the values X comma Y mod. And that's pretty much set for that. The next thing you want to do is set the stroke color for your shape that you've just described in your shape table and set a stroke weight. Now I have a variable SW there, which I haven't assigned yet, but I will here in just a second. I'm going to set that to uh, the interpolation of wherever its distance is away from its home place that Y mod. So I'm going to look at it and then assign it a stroke weight based on it. So it's going to be a thicker stroke when it's higher up the screen and it's supposed to get thinner stroke as it goes down the screen. You can have a fixed stroke weight, whatever you want there. It's not required. The program will work if you just set it. It still looks cool either way. But that adds a little bit extra dimension and gives it a neat effect at the bottom. So play around with that. So we're almost done here. We have one more thing to do, and that is when we get so far down or when things get so distorted, we want to restart things. Now there's lots of ways that you can do this, and just resetting the arrays is probably the easiest way. Uh, if you wanted to, as an additional challenge, uh, keep track of the ones that fall past a certain point. And when 
all of them in a row get past that certain point, then just send that row back up to the top, maybe reorder things. And uh, it, it could get pretty complicated, but it would be a really fun challenge. If you could pull it off, let me know in a comment. To restart the variables, to reset everything back, I just went up to when I initialized or created my first instance of this object, I had these starting variables. We'll just copy all that over into the restart method and then change a few things. So I'm not sure why I changed it. Maybe to just be super sure that I wasn't just uh, appending to an already open array. But at the very top, you can see I'm setting those this dot POSX and POSY. I'm setting all those equal to a blank array. So that should take everything out. So now I'm starting zero. So I can push values in and it's just going to do like it did before. But if you're at all worried about that, you can do it the old fashioned way and you can just move through an index value and inside the element, the brackets for the element number value, just put this dot index there. So instead of pushing it into whichever one is next in order, we're very deliberate and we're assigning it to exactly that element that we want to assign it to. And there's a couple ways that you can set your acceleration. You can do it randomly like I've done here, or you can use that, that local variable that will set the acceleration according to noise. So either way, I just set it back to uh, non-noise, just randomness, because it seemed to be okay. Uh, it seemed to work well that way. So whichever you feel looks best for you, I encourage you to use that, uh, that method. Inside the the reset, I'm setting new color values for red, green, and blue. And back a few moments ago in this video, I started to put in a color value inside the main part of the function and I took it out. Well, I should have left that there because it's going to give me the variety in the lines. You can see here, they're not all one color. They're in a color family and you get that distortion just by changing one of those color values inside the loops. So this is the part where I try to find out all that stuff that I didn't do right or changed in the middle of my video and didn't realize that that change was important. So there was a, a typo there. I hope you caught that when it happened and uh, looking for this bug. Now I can't see the output at all. I'm like, what's happening? And if I would have thought about it a little bit, the initial state of the color is zero, so there's not going to be any output initially. Uh, I have to change either the initial colors or wait until it gets to the end and then it goes through the restart and then it gets colors. So you can see that happens here. It's like, oh, now there's colors. This is like the second time in that. So once I realized that, I went to the the constructor part of my function and added random values instead of zeros there. And then that's going to work well for making every line the same color. And let's change the alpha so we can get some blurred output and a little bit more intensity. So to, to get the, the colors to be in a color family instead of being all one color, which that's kind of cool too, so however you feel about it, inside the loops, uh, before each row is drawn, let's pick a new color for maybe the red or the green or the blue, any one of those. So you're open to choose. I just chose red because it's the first in line and that's where my brain was first in line. So right here, I add that, that color value and I'm going to map it to noise. So instead of just taking a random number, I'm going to do a pseudo random number here with noise and that's where you get these kind of relational values there in the color family. Here at the end, I'm just going to make a few changes just so you can see what some of the color things do and uh, talk about something that you can do to help me out with reaching an audience that would be interested in this kind of content. Because the people who are interested in this kind of content is really small, they're not served in a mainstream way, which means the algorithm that's concerned about mainstream viewers and the mainstream signals, it's not going to share this video like it would anything else because people just aren't accessing this video in the same way. People usually watch bits and pieces of the video, whichever part is helping them, and then they move on with their life. They're not usually watching it from one end to the other. I mean, there are some are, and, but by and large, it's, 
it's kind of more, treated more like a reference work. And because of that, it's not making it to the people who might want to see it. I don't necessarily want it to be served to mainstream because not everyone in mainstream is interested in this. Like I said, it's just a small niche of people. And that's the, the difficulty, that's the challenge of getting this work out there. So if you know somebody who may be interested in this, please share the content. Uh, feed the algorithm. Hitting a thumbs up sends a really strong signal to the algorithm, so that helps as well. And leave in a cop, uh, comment. The algorithm can actually read those comments and gain some context and learn some signals from them so that it can use them to serve this content to people who might be interested in it without having to serve it, serve it to a mainstream audience. So that would help as well. And I can see some headway being made in this area. So if you would do all of those things, if you like this video and you want to see more like it, hit subscribe, hit the bell to be notified. And until next time, I guess that's it for this video. Thanks for watching. And as always, take care.